Hi everyone. It is my great privilege to talk with Dr. Larry Gwatz, former professor of saxophone at, at um, University of Southern Mississippi. Uh, thank you for joining me. Yes. Um, it is my great privilege to have this conversation with you, sir. Um, Thank you. I hope that you're all doing well. And um, yeah, let's go ahead and um, start with, like, I would like to know a little bit about your background, how, where you grew up, uh, what is your family um, background like? Is there any insp inspiration for you? Um, uh, How much would you like to hear? Well, as much as you can tell, you know. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm a native of Niagara Falls, New York, which if you know the geography of New York, you know, of yes. course, that it's on the western side, uh, fairly close to Buffalo. Uh, okay. And I uh, attended public school there. I started to play the saxophone uh, comparatively late, you might say, though it was not my first instrument. The first instrument I ever played and had in my hands was much too large for my body. Oh, wow. Uh, it was the accordion. Oh, I've never, I have never heard of it. Uh, oh, the accordion, uh, some people nickname it the squeeze box. It's, uh, okay. it sounds relatively close to an organ, but you play it horizontally across your body. Can, can uh -huh. you, see? here we go, there we go. Yes, I can. Play it this way, okay? Oh, okay. The keyboard is on the right side, and then there are chord buttons on the left. And, uh, well, like I said, it, it works like a squeeze box, so. Anyway, that experience didn't last much more than a month because uh, I was, first of all, I was, it was uh, too much of a burden on my body to uh, have the weight borne totally on my uh, upper body, you know, the shoulders and so forth. So after about a month's time, my parents returned the instrument and I never touched another musical instrument until age 13. So that, that's about eight years of time that uh, elapsed between the two experiences. So did uh, you say um, after that you didn't touch any instrument nope. until the age, age of uh, 13? 13, correct. And, and, and um, may I know what year was it, if it's possible? What, what year was this? Uh, that would have been 1966. Okay. Okay. So that tells you how, how old I am now. So anyway, um, what uh, the motivation to my starting the saxophone, a friend of mine who lived down the street from my parents and myself uh, came to visit and it was in the summertime of 1966 and he asked me what my plans were for the summer and as usual I didn't have very many at that age and he said why don't you start why don't you come with me for saxophone lessons through the uh, music program at the uh, school not too, terribly far from the home and sure. my mother heard that through the kitchen window and she came out and encouraged me to take him seriously uh -huh. Interesting. So Interesting. I said, fine, I'll try it. And so now, the, was this the in the middle school or? Um, well, at age, yes, yes. Yeah, it would have been, uh, well, where I attended, it was still called junior high school. Oh, okay. Okay, right before the eighth grade. So, um, so I joined him in the saxophone lessons. My parents rented for me 
a saxophone from the music store, which if I had known then what I know now about saxophones, I probably would have kept the instrument because they they were willing to sell the instrument to my parents for $200. Oh, wow. And uh, back then, you know, that was, well, it, it was an okay price. So anyway, but as it turned out, that instrument was a silver-plated busher from the early 1930s. And if you know anything about my playing career, you know that the instrument that I play now and have been playing for, oh gosh, probably close to, uh, well, more than 30 years now, uh, is also an, a busher from the 1930s. Yeah, I, 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 uh, I saw it from, uh, from a video that you were, I think that video was must be, oh gosh, 14 years ago, I would say 2007 that you were performing on that instrument. Uh-huh. Um, yeah, this sounds, sounds fantastic, I must say. Yeah. Yeah. Give me a moment, please. Sure. One moment. Yes. Yeah, okay. So, uh, what were we talking about? The Busher saxophone? Yes. Yeah, so anyway, but I was too young and naive to know much about the instruments then. So um, we returned that instrument and got a newer one, uh, a student model instrument. And interestingly enough, it was made by the same company, but uh, it was a much more modern instrument than the one that I started on. So now, do you, do you still have that instrument? with you or? well i i still have a a busher from 1931 that i do play yes okay. but that it is not that instrument not that particular one that i began with okay yeah but uh, it's very similar yeah so um the next question i would like to ask you is that what what was like i bet the environment is very different uh, when you were um, still studying saxophone compared, let's say, into the late 80s or early 80s or even 90s compared to now, I mean, it's uh, very different um, when you were in college. And uh, would, you, would you mind to talk about a little bit about your ex experience in how you end up to to college and where sure. where sure. did you go? And yeah, like my high school teachers, all of my high school teachers, the band director, my saxophone teacher, and so forth, were all graduates of a school in Western New York, south of Buffalo, called the State University of New York at Fredonia. Oh. Uh, and uh, it was one of the um, most in-demand places if you wanted to major in music or music education in New York State. Do they, do, do, they have a, do they have a saxophone major particularly at that time or no? Fredonia was the first college in the country to have a saxophone teacher. Okay. Yes. Wow. Yes. And um, in fact, the professor who was there at the time taught my first saxophone teacher. So, and who was your first saxophone teacher? His name, was, uh, my first saxophone teacher is no longer alive. His name was Jack Liss, L-I-S. Oh, okay. And uh, he taught for 30 some years at the Niagara Wheatfield School District. Mm. That's where I attended junior high school and high school. Mm. Niagara Wheatfield, then I went to that college in Fredonia, State University of New York at Fredonia. Mm. And I graduated there with a Bachelor of Music Education degree, but I also got what they called then, and still call to today, to this day, the Performer Certificate, which uh, added an additional requirement of an additional recital. 
Is it like uh, your equivalent to the, let's say, artist diploma? Yes. Okay. Yes, I would say so. Okay. So, um, so from Fredonia, after four years at Fredonia with a bachelor's degree, then I was offered a teaching assistantship at the University of Nebraska in Lincoln. Yeah, I, I read about it, yes. Yes, yeah, I, and I went there for one year because in the middle of that year, I was offered the possibility of teaching for only one year as a replacement at the University of Georgia. Uh, with Dr. Fletcher? No, uh, no. This was this was well before him. Oh, okay. This was well before him. And uh, the man's name who was there at the time was Kenneth Deans. I, I, I don't know. He I, was a student of Sigurd Rosher's also. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So Dr. Deans took one year off to do a residency for the doctorate in Iowa. And I took oh. his place. I took his place at the University of Georgia for one year. Oh. <clears throat> and then he returned and I in turn took his place in Iowa and took the teaching assistantship at the University of Iowa where I eventually completed the doctorate. So did you get, uh, I no, I know that you completed your doctor in the University of Iowa. So did you get a DMA or PhD? Yes, DMA. Oh, DMA. okay. Yeah. So was a major in saxophone? Yes. So studied the study. They also with... studied clarinet and flute. Okay, it's multiple woodwinds. Right? Well, no, the degree was not multiple woodwinds. It was simply by choice that I stud took lessons on those instruments. Okay, so um, I I could be wrong, but uh, at that time the the professor must be uh, uh, Doctor Waxman, right? At the at the Waxman? yeah. He was my advisor for the doctorate. So he was not the professor of saxophone, or no. Okay. But I did take classes from him in woodwind literature and woodwind pedagogy. Okay. So, um, at some point, um, I guess, did you, did you start, uh, did you work with, uh, Professor Sigurdsson or did you study with him? Yes, I had several lessons with him privately. Okay. Uh, both at workshops that he held uh, in the north, as well as here at Southern Mississippi when I had him as a guest. Okay. Yes. Oh, wow, that's pretty rich experience. Oh yes. Yeah. Um, would you would you talk about your experience with him, please, if you don't mind? Well, what would you like to know? Um. Uh, Anything, uh, basically anything um, you, you would like to share, like uh, how his teaching, like how his instructions, like uh, what what good advice he gave to his, his students. And um, by the way, um, just right before I have this interview with you, I watched one of your tips on YouTube that you recorded um, in 2007 that you played in the old instrument that you just mentioned. Um, I do not remember what the piece's name, um, but it's, uh, it is a Baroque period piece. Um, and I, the, the first, the first um, emotion or the first uh, tension Trust me, is that your your song and your phrase is very much. Uh, it's like a, it give me a feeling of your copied um, Professor Sigrusher's sound. Um, 
which uh, which I love very much, and uh, I was wondering if you can t discuss a little bit of that. Um, I know that uh, well, you you you've mentioned two different things now. You asked for uh, what advice he gave me, but now you've raised yeah. the yeah. issue of the tone quality. Now, wh so, which would you like me to uh, address first? So the first uh, thing I I would like to have you discuss a little bit it is that uh, his teaching philosophy and his advice and his, his okay and all right also the repertoire please fine okay thank you if you know enough about Mr. Rosher's life story then it won't surprise you to hear that the number one the top priority in his teaching was total and sheer musicianship, artistry. He always expected the highest artistic level from people with whom he worked and taught. So um, with that in mind, it, it was shared with me even before I ever met him. Okay. That Mr. Rosher played the saxophone in the same manner that the inventor, Adolf Sax, in Belgium, wanted it to sound like. Mm. It, it, he used equipment, especially so the mouthpiece that was very, very similar to the mouthpiece that's described by Adolf Sachs himself in the patent letters for the instrument. Mm. The diagram of the mouthpiece is exactly the same. And the dimensions of the mouthpiece that Mr. Rosher played were likewise the same. So when I heard that, and because I was <clears throat> taught very early on that the mouthpiece is very influential when it comes to the quality of tone that a person produces. Well, the natural reaction I had was to try and find the same kind of mouthpiece, which was not difficult at the time. I found a Rosher mouthpiece in the music store, not far from the college that I first attended. And I must admit that it was not the easiest <laughs> mouthpiece to play on yeah, I bet. But that's because I was an impatient player and an impatient student. I wanted immediate results. And most people, even in this day, want an immediate result when in truth, Mr. Rosher's own letter to the, uh, to the buyer in the container with the mouthpiece advises the person to allow at least two months, eight weeks of time playing on that mouthpiece and that mouthpiece only before you make a judgment. So um, I gave it the eight weeks, but I still wasn't satisfied because, uh, you know, when you're, when you're playing a different style mouthpiece for so many years before you try this, you cannot try to play a Rosher type mouthpiece or an Adolf Sax type mouthpiece. Yeah, I bet it's very the different. Same way that, that in the same way that you play, say, a mouthpiece made by the Selmer company or some other modern company. So it, it was a difficult adjustment. But by and by, I did make the adjustment. And, um, and, after some years of playing on the mouthpiece, then I decided to uh, make yet another change. And I found a Busher saxophone, as I mentioned earlier, a Busher saxophone that was very similar to, first of all, to the same instrument that I started on when I was 13, but it's also the same kind of Busher saxophone that Mr. Rosher himself played. So, you know, it's kind of in this country, we have the expression like teacher, like student. So yes, yes. decided to follow in those steps. 
And before long, I was making more and more connections with Mr. Rosher personally, as well as through mail communication. Back then, you know, writing a letter wasn't yeah, so it's a very common, common thing. Yes. Yeah, so uh, in fact, I'm even told that there are letters from Mr. Rosher to me and vice versa, my letters to him in the Rosher archive at Fredonia in the, in the library there. Okay. So anyway, back then to did, um, your, yeah, did Mr. Rosher ta teach at the Manhattan School of Music? Oh, that was many, many, many years prior. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, uh, he, by and large, offered private instruction at his home or workshops, such as those that he offered at the Eastman School, at Union College in Schenectady, New York, he came down here and offered three workshops. He gave one in Atlanta during the 90, uh, 90s and at Yale oh. University. He also gave workshops in Germany, of course. Yes, yes. So, I know this. Yes, so anyway, um, the years passed and I got to play live concerts and with Mr. Rosher in the audience. And the, those are experiences that one cannot forget because he was probably not only the most influential performer on my career and on my teaching, but he was also the strongest supporter and encourager to me. He always told me uh, more than once, he came up to me after a concert and said, please don't stop. Continue doing what you are doing. Wow, that's very special. And, yes, it is. And it is so encouraging. Yes. Yeah. So Thank you. Thank it's, you so much. It's, yes, it's easy to then understand why so much of my, my work, my career, my performances, and so forth, had such a uh, close connection with his tradition. A and the reason I made those de that decision early on was, again, the information that I, uh, that wasn't difficult to find out that Mr. Rosher did things in the manner that the inventor wanted to have them done. Mr. Rosher, when he made his big splash of a performance with the Berlin Philharmonic back in 1932. Oh, yeah, was, was it 1932? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, that That's explained in the first page, of, or not the first page, but the uh, early page, the introduction of the Top Tones book for saxophone. So, oh, yeah, yeah. I I, yes. uh, I own that book. When he played the Edmund von Bork concerto. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Concerto that was composed for him. Adolf Sachs's daughter was in the audience at that concert. And some days afterwards, she sent him a message telling him that if her father had been alive and in attendance at that concert, that that would have been how he would have wanted the saxophone to sound. Oh, wow. That's really high a compliment. Yes, of course. Yeah. So when you put all of that information together and then the possibility of having his instruction and assistance, it, it didn't take rocket science to tell me that I should continue that way. Mm. So, so, okay, so just the phone just... Yeah, yeah, we can continue. Yes. yes. Um, you, you're, you're talking about the concerto performance of uh, Mr. Rosher. Yes. Yeah, and, and uh, yeah, so I guess I, uh, I must say this is a very, um, very high, uh, very high level of, um, you know, encouragement or Rosher's probably the highest accomplishment. 
Yes. Yeah. And uh, um, so, could you could you talk about he um, like the uh, the repertoire that you you were working on at at that time and um, um, his system of uh, uh, when I was a student. Repertoire. Yes. Yes. Well, at Fredonia, I had a, a, a pretty well varied repertoire handed to me. And sometimes I chose pieces myself because I would either discover them in a store somewhere and would pick up a copy of this or that. Um, I mean, of course, I studied the, the typical standard repertoire, Creston, Haydn, Ebert, um, Glazunov and, uh, you know, all the, even De Sanclo, you know, even though uh, Fredonia wasn't necessarily known to be grounded in the French repertoire, but the teacher there uh, nevertheless recognized that there were pieces from Paris that oh, yes. were worthy of uh, knowledge be, regardless of our heritage. So, yeah, on my senior recital, for example, De Sanclo's Prelude, Cadence and Finale, uh, was on the program. In fact, uh, that was a piece that I took to a master class in Toronto, Canada, where Jean Rilandex was teaching. Oh wow! And I played played it for him too. Wow! Yeah. Now, Monsieur Landex and I wound up meeting a few times thereafter. To the point that in the middle of uh, well, no, in the let's see, it was nineteen, was it ninety five? I think yeah, I think so. In nineteen ninety five, uh, the university here gave me a sabbatical. Uh, I don't know if you know what that is, but that's yes, a, yes, okay, okay. So uh, part it's of like a is it is it like it's a, a semester research. away from the job? Yeah, it's a, like a research right a research break. So for two weeks, I went to Bordeaux and had a few lessons with Monsieur, Monsieur Londex in his apartment. Oh. So, and, um, but anyway, yeah, uh, I played the De saint Claude for him in Toronto and he remembered me all through the years thereafter from that experience because the next time I saw him, I think would have been, uh, a year or so later in Nebraska, where I went for the master's degree. Oh, wow, that's exciting. Yes, and well, he wasn't uh, at my school, but uh, some of us traveled to where he was. It was about a two hour drive or so. And uh, he saw me there and he said, oh, Monsieur Guaz, how are you? He reckoned, he remembered <laughs> my name and everything. Yeah, yeah, it was quite quite nice. So, um, and then let's see, the next time uh, occurred, oh, yeah, we had him here. I had him here as a guest, uh, as a lecturer actually. And, um, and then well, not too many years thereafter, he actually heard my saxophone orchestra perform in uh, both uh, sax, well, let's see, he heard us play in Montreal and he heard us play in Minneapolis at the World Saxophone Congress. Okay, that's what I was thinking, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, uh, Londex and I, Monsieur Londex and I, uh, we became quite friendly there for a while. Yes. So, yeah. and uh, so back to your question about repertoire. Yeah, I, I studied many major works at Fredonia, then when I went to Nebraska, where the teacher was much more trained in the French repertoire, then of course uh, I explored that more, such as the old oh, Tableau de Provence of Paul et Maurice, you know, and other such pieces. And uh, and then, okay, I taught for the one year at Georgia, and I played a faculty recital there that had a mixture of music on it, and. Um, then at Iowa, it, it was again a mixture of French music. Uh, Pierre Max Dubois Sonata was on one of my DMA recitals, and and um, 
So, but, but then as the years passed and I became more active as a uh, teacher, saxophone teacher at, at uh, colleges and began to play concerts away from the job at other uh, conventions and colleges and so forth and so on, uh, I began to concentrate more heavily in, on the repertoire of Mr. Rosher himself and uh, began to, uh, you know, spread the news about the repertoire that he was responsible for, not just Ebert or Glazunov, but pieces by Dressel, um, Husa, and uh, Hindemith, and, and so forth and so on. You know, I mean, I could, I could sit here and, you know, I, I had a few performances of the Larson and von Koch concertos, you know, and those, wow. those are that don't necessarily get played much. Yes, yes. You know, and yeah. uh, so every chance that I got, I I took advantage of such possibilities. But uh, and of course, you probably know by now that there there are a few CDs out with uh, that are dedicated to uh, Mr. Rosher's repertoire that I'm playing, yeah. and um, as well as some pieces that were composed for me as well. Yeah, so uh, that's the question I will mention to you later. But um, now, uh, would you would you mind um, to talk about your um, um, teaching philosophy and how you end up teaching at uh, uh, Western well, well, Southern Mississippi University? University of Southern Mississippi. Well, I got this job as a result of the early passing of the prede my predecessor, Dr. Kenneth Deans. Oh. He passed away at an early age, very suddenly, and the job came open, and I moved here from the job I held prior to it in Wisconsin, where I was band director and woodwinds teacher. Oh, and th okay. That goes back to 1984. So, uh, as you recall, I mentioned Kenneth Deans earlier as a former student of Rosher's, and it was very fitting that they took me as the replacement for him because of the common background that he and I shared. Mm. So, um, and then as far as philosophy goes, well, again, that mirrors one more time, I have to say, it mirrors what Mr. Rosher instilled in me, which was musicianship and tone quality first. Not to say that technique wasn't important because if you've heard recordings of Mr. Rosher playing, you know that he had incredible technique. Yes, yes, I know that's that. But uh, the, the musicianship, the artistry with which he played was unmatched. And it was my intention to continue that tradition. And I was able to do that here at this university for 36 years. Yeah, so, um, so uh, could you talk about your um, uh, teaching experience at, the, at that university? Um, I bet um, uh, the, the, the time when you just start and uh, the time after six, six, after 36 years, sorry, after six. Uh, the studio after, here, yeah. when I first took it, had 14 students in it. Yeah. Before much longer, that enrollment almost doubled. So, yeah, at one point, we had as many as uh, 28 or 29 saxophone students in the studio. Oh, Most. Wow more music majors yes and uh, as the studio grew so did the performance opportunities and as you probably know we have even to this day a saxophone orchestra a cha saxophone chamber orchestra is it still there still there uh, yes okay yes um, it's called the sax chamber, and it's a hyphenated word, sax chamber, because everyone in that orchestra plays a mouthpiece built like the Adolf Sax mouthpiece. Oh, wow. Yes. And That's very special. 
Well, but you can find them quite easily. They're out. The, uh, the Rosher mouthpiece again is one of those. So, yeah. Is that all there in the on the market? Yes. Okay. okay. All you have to do is go on on the internet and type on Rosher mouthpiece. Yeah, I will. I will take a look. I'm I'm so interested to check that out. The teacher at Fredonia is now the salesman for them. His name is Wildy Zumwalt. You can find him quite easily. Okay. Okay, I will uh, I will um, take a look. Um, yeah. Thank so, you. <clears throat> the saxophone chamber orchestra here, <clears throat> excuse me, um, has played concerts uh, in not only the United States at big conventions and whatnot, but also in Canada. I mentioned Montreal. We played at the Congress there. We played in uh, Minneapolis at the Congress there. We played on the campuses of uh, various colleges and high schools, not just in the South, but in uh, even the Midwest and the North. So, mm. and uh, students from here now have, have graduated and have moved on to their own teaching positions or, or performance positions. One of my students, right, uh, former students right now is playing in the Army Band of Europe. Oh, really? Yes. Oh. And um, uh, the, there are students, as I mentioned before, there are students teaching at various colleges across the country now. And so, you know, the the position here has been quite fruitful and now continues to be under the new teacher. So what, uh, what is his name? I, I know he graduated Espinoza from- uh, is his his name is Danel, Dr. Danel Espinoza. Espinoza, okay. Yes. So I, I know uh, him from, uh, I, I mean, I know of him. Uh, I, I didn't meet him in person, but I know that he graduated from Eastman School of Music, I believe. Correct. Yeah. Uh, a uh, former student of Dr. Chen Kuan Lin. Yes. Yeah. And so, great. Um, so but the, before that, he studied with uh, Patrick Meehan at Florida State. And before that, his first saxophone uh, experience at the university level was at Northern Arizona University with Dr. Jonathan Bergeron. And Jonathan Bergeron was a former student of mine here. Oh, wow. That's, that's, uh, that's such, a, such a small world. Yes. Uh, yeah. That's yes. a, it's a pretty interesting circle. Yes. Yeah. So I would like to, you know, someday have a work experience with you. And so I'm pretty, pretty interested in your, uh, your teaching. You know? Okay. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm sorry, but I, I didn't have the pleasure to, to have work with you uh, during your. Well, I do some occasional teaching here at my home okay. so so uh could you uh, could you talk about if you don't mind could you talk about your um um i guess that's uh, brings me to the next big topic is that i know i know from reading and i know from other teacher that had mentioned that you have some uh uh, your body have some difficulties, right? So yes, could you could you talk about it? If you well, when I was born, they first thought that I was born with polio. Oh. At that time, um, spina bifida was not a highly researched uh, weakness as it is now, of course. But um, after many medical tests and so forth during my infancy, they determined that it was not polio, but rather spina bifida. And they performed surgery on the base of my spine to make as good a correction of it as they possibly could. Is that on, the, on your back? Yes. Okay. I know, yes. I, I know uh, several teachers, not several, but um, yeah, I know several people has this. Um, 
um, you know, um, you probably know or not, but I live with a physical disability also. Yes. Uh, you know that, right? Yes. Um, you told me. Yes. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't even remember. I don't even remember. So, um, so I was born in, in Southwest China. And uh, when I was born, which, which was back um, 1993. Um, How close uh, were you to the city Xi'an? Oh, it's uh, it's about it's about um, two hours flight. It's not not too far. It's uh, well, I, I've been there. Yes, I played there. Oh, really? Yes, it's, and in Beijing. Well, yeah, yeah, I've been in Beijing as well. Um, Nineteen ninety nine. I had those concerts. Oh wow! Unbelievable. Yeah. Um, so, I did a master class in both uh, at the conservatory in Beijing. I believe it was the conservatory. Yeah, the Central Conservatory. I believe so, and in Xi'an. Oh wow! Actually, a, a fairly big studio, saxophone studio there. So yeah, yeah, I I, I know I know and the, I will never I forget that there. concert. I will never forget that concert I played there because they assigned to uh, accompany me a young, I think he was only 21 years old, a young student pianist who won a competition there uh, by the, uh, the competition was with the Pearl River Piano Company. Oh, okay. And he played the whole program with me, including the sonata of Stephen Dankner that was composed for me uh, in 1997, two years before that. Mm. And it was every bit as challenging as the score to the Creston Sonata. Uh -huh. And uh, he played it like a master. The, the pianist? Yes. Oh. Yes. Oh. It was an enjoyable experience beginning to end. I, I, I wonder who... Uh, I wonder who that person is. I, mean, I wish I could tell you now, but I can't. Okay, it's okay. Uh, but I have the poster from that concert in one of my rooms here at the house. And and, and it might oh. tell the poster, but I just, I don't know. Oh, okay, it's okay. Um, yeah. I'm sure that you and I will have... Um, uh, some uh, some collaborations from this this point. I would love to keep in touch with you. Very good. Yes, I mean, it's it's gonna be my privilege. Big pleasure. Um, yeah. So I was born in Chengdu, and um, uh, unfortunately, I was born in with cerebral palsy. I don't know if have you heard about it. Oh, of course, I know that. I know. When I was in elementary, well, first grade, kindergarten and first, no, no, I take that back. First and second grade, I was in a class of uh, with other students who had disabilities, and there was a young man there who had cerebral palsy. Okay. I know what that's like, yes. Yeah, so my cerebral palsy, um, I will say, affected me not so bad um affected some of my physical abilities for example i could not walk independently i had to use crutches uh -huh. and, and i have to um I, I cannot walk long for example i can only walk in the in the within like a room distance so for example, if I have to go out, I have to use wheelchair. Um, so I have to um, uh, sit the most of the time. I understand. Yeah, and uh, and uh, um, the uh, there's a there's a conversation about between me and my parents that I was gonna go to some schools with special education. Um, 
of course, uh, me and my parents uh, figure that is a terrible idea. Uh, what it is is that basically the school of people who cannot talk, people who cannot take care of themselves, feed themselves, like dress themselves up, uh -huh. uh, and uh, you know, it's uh, they will not be able to get a normal. Uh, a valued educational experience and uh, anyway that's that is not option for me and right. so and so i went to normal elementary school and i i went later on i went to a middle school and high school which is one of the best schools in chengdu in my city where i was born and um but unfortunately, I was the only student in the class that had a disability. And um, I must say that um, from that point on, the teacher and the student both treated me, I, I, I'm not saying bad, but um, with, with some differences, you know. Um, yes. You know, they they do not get along with me that well they they laugh at my disability um but um when the time when i was in middle school i that's when i become very interested in the saxophone was one of was because one of my classmate uh former classmate and one of my best friend who uh played the saxophone in band in the school school wind ensemble and one one afternoon after lunch he and i sitting in the classroom and he he had a he had a i, I guess yamaha 62 um saxophone i don't exactly quite remember but he he had on his head and i i told him to play a little bit for me and i just when he the time after he took out his sex was i was so in love with it and i told my parents i said i want i want to uh, play uh, yeah and so when i was about 15 i i i don't know if you know the name of professor Yu Sheng Li. Um, uh, where is he? He he was a he is a professor of saxophone at Sichuan Conservatory, and he is the first full time saxophone professor in China. Uh, I prop I I I would think that perhaps I met him when I was over there. Sichuan, did you go to Sichuan? It's not far from Xi. No, the only cities I I went to were the ones I mentioned before. Okay, okay. And then you probably didn't did not meet him, but okay. um, yeah. So because of my disability, I could not um, go to university level studios to study saxophone. But uh -huh. uh, there's just not they're not make exception for me because of my disability right that's unfortunate yeah uh, <laughs> yeah and so but i studied it with him privately and for four years uh, i enjoyed it even though i was not a, able to be in the orchestra or ensemble or symphony or whatever big group but yeah you know i i took lessons privately with him for four years and i enjoyed it and he he taught me uh, a lot of uh, repertoire that I should be studying, uh, yeah. So and and at that time he even gave me some career advice uh, as a as a as a musician as a saxophonist with disabilities, uh, and uh, yeah. And then in two thousand. 12 after i graduated from high school i met not so back in 2010 i had the pleasure to come to the united states of america to uh visit 
with Dr. Rep Bender. You probably know him. Um, How did you know him? So, so Dr. Bender was the guest, frequent guest artist at the Sutron Conservatory, and he is a uh, good friend of Professor Yu Sheng Li. I and, see. And uh, and so he he started to visit it with the conservatory in beginning in. 2003 and since then he 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 uh he visited there i will say 10 times 11 times a lot mm -hmm. and um so i played for him um uh you know in a couple master classes and i actually intended one of his workshops he host he hosted here in southern oregon that's mm -hmm. how uh that workshop was in 2010 and i at that time i was still in high school and yeah. before yeah after i graduated i applied it to his program he ultimately accepted me as a student member and but before um uh, before i come here to become a student he told my parents saying that I should be able to study in the United States as a saxophone major student. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so it was um, a good experience. And I finished uh, my degree, Bachelor of Arts uh, um, in music, majoring in saxophone this, this past June. So it took me uh eight years and so i worked on my degree for six years and then before that i spent two years studying english at that school i see yeah yeah um yeah so th that's that's about my experience and so back to your um experience um would you would you be able to give any any advice on career building for musicians with disability? Or, uh, because I I I have some ideas I I would like to share with you uh, later. Well, I seldom allowed the disability that I have had to be a factor, uh, at least negatively, to be a factor in my career development. I, pr I proceeded with my career as if the disability wasn't even present. But when uh, now, for instance, you know, when it came to certain needs, like I needed to park close to my building and so forth and so on. Well, usually you can drive, right? You can. I, I can drive. Yes. A normal, um, normal car. Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, but you know, I would simply have to pro uh, provide medical evidence uh, with a doctor's letter or something that would allow me to park closer and give me uh, privileges in terms of uh, you know accommodation be yes. being closer to the building and so forth. So, on. and uh, of course, uh, my studio when I was teaching here at the university. The studio was relatively close to the elevator. So, oh, wow. yes. That's very convenient. Yes. So, but other than that, you know, when it came to, say, playing concerts overseas in Europe and Asia and so on, um, I, I will admit, yes, uh, there were challenges on those tours, but uh, there was always someone there who would offer a little bit of assistance, like, can I take your saxophone from you? And I would let them take it because it was so... Yes, yes. the saxophone is relatively heavy. Sure. Yeah. 
um, when you ask a question like that, I, I guess the uh, the only assistance that uh, that I can offer is at one point, and I'm having a little bit of trouble remembering what years this was, but I ran into an organization known as, in this country, an organization known as Very Special Arts. And they're based in Washington, in the Kennedy Center. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I know that organization, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I found out that they were managing a festival one year, um, VSA, oh, I can't remember what they called it now, but they had concerts all around the city of Washington, D.C. And they invited me to play at that festival. And I played a, a full recital. And uh, it, in fact, that recital occurred in, um, oh, it, uh, what was it called? It was like a transportation center of some sort right in the middle of the city. And um, so anyway, you know, uh, I got involved with that organization a little bit. But uh, other than that, uh, I must say that uh, how Spina Bifida got involved with my uh, playing, I, I would say it, it had minimal place. Now, people would notice that I did not walk normally. And uh, if they wanted to ask questions, I didn't mind answering them as to, you know, what it was all about and so forth. But uh, uh, I mean, you know, there, there are some places in this world where they still don't accommodate for people with uh, issues like this and you just have to make the best of it. Yeah, I'm, I, I'm so appreciative and so thankful that you can open this discussion with me. So thank you very yeah. much. Sure. Yeah, and uh, um, so, you know, I have uh, I have spent a lot of time as a as a as a child, uh, from my childhood that I spent a lot of time doing sport and you know physical training like therapy like uh, since like that, um, but I've never had any serious surgery. Um, there's one talk about that like. Uh, I was going to have a surgery on my um, on one of my foot, but uh, just that just didn't happen. So I was so <laughs> scared to have uh -huh. that surgery. Uh, but um, so I've come across a lot of people with disability, and so I guess they're not quite as positive as let's see people like you, people like, you know, Dr. David Knapp, uh, you know, um, and, and um, I, I know them quite well, I should say, I know them quite well. And um, they always ask me, well, if you wanted to do art and music, you know, where is the career path for, for all of us? And um, there's one uh, one fact is that you probably don't know that I'm the first Chinese person, Chinese student with disability to have a college degree in music. Yeah, any, I did not know that. Yeah, I'm the first one. But it doesn't surprise me. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I worked really hard. Um, so I'm sure. I'm I'm the first one. Uh, with, uh, if you talk about piano performance, music education, music in general, woodwinds performance, whatever, I'm the first one in China, and and so a, a lot of people are surprised that I can work this this far and finish a degree like that because I mean 
a university degree, yeah, any type is pretty, I would say, prestigious. It's a very, it's very, it's like an honor if you can finish it. Yeah. It's, um, you know, I, I've come across with those people and, um, and then I got a lot of questions back, back from them. They say, how did you, how did you even, you know, get to manage, manage of it? And how did you finish it? Or, you know, what kind of difficulties, you know, you, you have faced? I mean, um, um, for me, I, as a saxophonist, uh, my experience will be much harder than yours because, first of all, like I said, I cannot walk independently. I have I have trouble to you know travel far, but that doesn't mean I cannot. But I just take a lot of time to to get ready, but I still can do. And uh, I have trouble to you know uh on my on my fingers uh, like like let's say i have some difficulties to play fast stuff but um uh, overall over this years of working out i i work really hard and so this ability is getting better um um and and so i i just don't you know there's no reason for them for for anybody to go against each other saying that oh because you have disability you you can you shouldn't play music or you shouldn't have a career right right uh, right and so my uh my idea is that i wanted to build a music program either in the in in the united states of america or in china to to help those people who wants to um, study music and uh, to build a music career later you know quite high level you know uh, you know very uh, professional level and so they can have a career of that and for example, I will be focusing on people who lost ability with their one of their hand, like Dr. David Nett does. Um, yes. And, and also people who uh, have a cerebral palsy, um, people who had an accident, and also people who who are really blind, like you know. They all wants to play the saxophone, or they all wants to play music. Uh, my idea is that I wanted to build a organization for them. I I I don't know if you have any uh, any advice or any uh, possibility, any you know, uh, any connections or any anything you like to offer to me. The organization I mentioned to you could be helpful to you. Very yeah. special arts. I would explore them. They, I'm sure they are on the internet. In fact, I know they are on the internet. So I, I would find them and see what possibilities might happen for you through them. Okay. Yeah. Other than that, though, I must say that I... I I don't have much to offer, uh, and I apologize for that. But oh, no, no, you don't have to apologize. I'm just well, so curious. It, it's just that, as I said earlier, I wasn't one to necessarily focus my attention and other people's attention on the way I walk. Right, right. You know? I, I would rather have them use their ears and focus their attention on what I play. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, you're right. So I, for, for example, if I see you, I wouldn't focus on any of my attention on how you walk. 
that's just I I still see you as a as a as a normal person, you know, as, yes. a, as a professor, as a teacher, that a, a person, a friend, a very good friend that I respect and and I admire. Uh, you know, I wouldn't pay any attention on your disability. That's yeah. So, uh, so lately I started a, um, uh, the reason why I started this podcast is that I wanted to get uh, advice for from people, um, people who study music with disability. So, uh huh. Yeah, and uh, another another thing that um, um, now that I'm just thinking that um, I know the school, every school, every studio have syllabus, right? So you have yes. your, you have your own syllabus, and so you have your own repertoire list. Yes, and and, and so um, for example. What I would like to hope to see in the future, of, especially in the American saxophone playing, is that I I would like to see there is a door open for disability student to get into the college level to study. Now, what I mean by I that, tell you this much: at this university, that possibility is very strong. We have a disabled student office that works together with the student with the disability and accommodations and so forth and so on. So if you were ever interested, let's just say if you wanted to pursue the doctorate in saxophone and you wanted to come here, that would be a very good possibility. Okay. Okay. Um, I, I, you know, I will, I will uh, consider that, consider that in the future, for the future. I realize that wasn't the intention of this discussion, but, you know, if you are in fact <clears throat> looking for such possibilities, I will say that that possibility does in fact exist here. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Yeah. And, uh. So the point is that I wanted to see a school open a syllabus. Let's see the, the list of repertoire for for people who with, with with certain abilities, uh, with disabilities. That the repertoire maybe not too technical, or maybe too maybe not too fast. Um, maybe let's say focused on lyrical playing the most. I see. Uh, I that that that's what I wanted to see the American second playing to be focused on in the future. I see. I I don't know I don't know if you think that's it is possible. Well, I, I've never had to adjust the repertoire before this. Now. You, as you know, I have retired from the university. So yes. that kind of question and discussion would have to go, take place with the new teacher, Espinoza. Okay. And you, you would have to mention our discussion here in your communication with him. And you can say that it was because of this communication that you are asking such questions of him, and I'm sure he would answer you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, he's a nice fellow. I, 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 I can, I can imagine. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, so I know that you had a very rich teaching experience as well as performing. Um, would you have any advice to give to people who, let, let's say, have a cerebral palsy or have like only one functional head? Like, you know, um, 
do you have any advice to give to them on uh, their studies, their performing, perform, performing uh, opportunity seeking or anything? I would say do, my words of encouragement would be to do the best you can with what you have available. Okay. When I was growing up, there was an expression. If you're delivered lemons, make lemonade. Well, yeah, th that's the and first that, time I heard I, it. It was something that I applied to my own life. Okay. I mean, you're- Lemonade, then it's something good. <laughs> yeah. You're, uh, yeah, so uh, Professor, thank you so much. I mean, I would say that you're definitely one of the one of the people that you might buy. It's 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 uh, it's my motto. So thank you. Well, you're welcome. Yeah. So uh, if yeah. you have nothing further. Yeah, is there anything you like to add or? No, I, I would just say God bless you in your work. Thank you. I I wish you all the best and thank you for your time and, and generosity and everything. Okay. And you can stay in contact with me as you wish. I would love to. That's that's um my biggest privilege. Um, okay. Um and I'm um, hoping that in the future, you and I can have this kind of um, um, discussion again. Not, not this exactly the same discussion, but other. Perhaps uh, it could be face to face. Yes, I would in love that. Room. I would love that. Um, yeah. As a matter of fact, um, if you don't mind, after this coronavirus, all taken care of and after we all allowed to travel i would love to come and visit with you that would be very good yeah welcome to do so thank you so much and uh, like i said um i couldn't thank you enough for your generosity for your time and for your great advice for your all right uh, you have my recordings, yes? The CDs? I'm sorry? Do you do you have any of my recordings? The um, CDs? No, unfortunately, I, I do not. Well, so, they're very uh, very much available. If you look at look them up on the internet, you can have them sent to you. Okay, so do you know any place that I can uh, I can purchase? And... Yes. Um try Amazon. Okay. Just just type your name. Type my name and CDs and you'll see them. Hopefully you'll see them all. Okay. Thank you. And yep. and and, uh, and would you would you remind me one more time how do you spell your last name? Uh, so that I don't get it. I don't get it wrong. You had it correct, except except that the vowel was wrong. <laughs> An A, oh, and it should be an O. Oh, okay. That's G all. You, that was the only error. Is it, is it like G W O Z D Z? Correct. Okay. Yes. Okay, and uh, you are your first uh, first name is Lawrence. Well, Lawrence. I was Lawrence. Lawrence. Yeah. And and so. Uh, you like to be called uh, Larry? Well, of course friends, I, friends yeah. call me Larry, but it, but the, the name I was born with was Lawrence. So yeah, yeah, but of course for me I will I will call you I will call you Doctor Doctor Quartz. Quartz, correct. Yeah, I will call you Doctor Quartz. Just all right. Just, you know, be re, be re all right then. Well, you have a good dinner tonight. Thank you, and and I wish <laughs> you the best. Okay. I appreciate it. Good and night. So I will send you the recording of this. Okay. Uh, yeah. That would be fine. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Bye bye. bye. bye.